Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. And we're going to dis- dispel some fallacies about the local church. Um, I got saved in April of 84, and I've always been part of a church experience, but when I first gave my life to Jesus, I had so much baggage, uh, rejection baggage. Uh, I came to the Lord out of a broken relationship, and, um, you know, I had baggage from my family and overbearing parents. My dad was an alcoholic. You know, you, you, your filters are created through your experiences in life. And then when you're launched out into life, uh, you see everything through those filters. And uh, what you learn growing up in order to compensate for all the deficits in your life, uh, many of them from a dysfunctional family, is that you create coping mechanisms in your life. And, of course, isolation is one of your coping mechanisms because... Uh, a lot of times when you're around people, uh, you, you can get into a kind of an emotional paralysis because you're afraid to experience something that would traumatize you because you have a history of trauma. Uh, am I the only person? Okay. So basically, when I first got saved and gave my life to the Lord, uh, it was a very interpersonal thing. It wasn't a community thing. And it was God reassuring me and connecting with me uh, to let me know that I'm all right. I'm going to be okay. Uh, I just need some process. I need to have my mind uh, transformed. I need to think differently. I need to have kingdom paradigms and kingdom perspectives in regard to my social interactions. Um, There was a lot of things that A lot of people did that they were very, very comfortable with, and uh, they were naturals at social interaction. That was always not natural for me. Uh, You know, people come, hey, you know, we're going to the school dance. You want to go? Heck no, I ain't going to no school dance. Getting out there making a fool of myself because I, I, you know, I got no rhythm, right? (laughs) Guilty feet got no rhythm here, right? And I had a lot of condemnation, so uh-uh, not me. And even to this day, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I can, I can keep a beat and everything, but I'm not much of a dancer. And Sandra is such a little social butterfly, a little extrovert and stuff. Come on, let's dance. No, I don't want to do it, right? So you know, if that was an important issue to rise above, I'd probably put some focus on that. But I spent like two years. Uh, being a believer and just listening to people on a radio program because I was intimidated about the possibility of engaging in a church somewhere. My older sister who prayed me into the kingdom and who was sort of encouraging me over the phone on a regular basis uh, said, uh, she called me Scotty, and that's my middle name, Scotty. She said, you know, the Lord told me in prayer, you need to get in church. You know, this is no longer uh, negotiable. You need to get in church. What God has done for you up to this time is amazing, but stop it now. Get in church. So I don't know what I I don't know where to go. I don't know. She says, you know, I hear good things uh, about this pastor called Jack Kafer. Go to church on the way. It's in Van Nuys. Check it out, and you know, we'll see what God says. Right. So I go to the church and I walk in, and uh, my guards up. I'm in the tent, right, and. I get in there, and and I'm it's big, it's huge. There's so many people. It's not like I got to learn to warm up to five people. There's like 1,500 people, and just that alone was made me nervous, right? And he started to preach a message, and I'm trying to connect with the message, and I'm struggling, right? And uh, I was really uncomfortable with the experience. I, I I felt I was perceptive in hearing from the Lord. I didn't really feel like I got anything when I left church. I left with sort of a resolve that this, no, this, this isn't where God wants me. This is not for me. And I got in the car, and I'm driving down the Hollywood Freeway to go home, and I'm dialoguing with God, and I said, Lord, I don't think this is where I'm supposed to be because I didn't get anything. Now, I said that out loud. I said, Lord, I didn't get anything. This isn't, I'm not going back. This isn't me. This will date me, but when I got home, uh, 
I walked in and I had the little radio shack blinking red light answer machine for my landline. And it was blinking, so I thought, I wonder who's calling me. So I pushed the button, and it was my sister. And she was moving in the, uh, the prophetic uh, at that time, and she said, you know, I was in prayer. The Lord spoke to me, and he told me to tell you. Now, this really happened. She said, he told me to tell you to go back to church on the way and go back with an attitude of what you can give and not what you can get. Because I said out loud, I'm not, I didn't get anything. And God said, it ain't about you, Right? I need you there because I want you to connect with believers and, and I'm going to work with you there uh, through your processes. And that's when I realized that people are part of your process, right? And without process, there's no progress, right? And so if we isolate, we're not moving forward. We're in a state of arrested development. Uh, the Bible even says that those that isolate themselves, they rage against the truth. Uh, they're angry that God wants to deal with their stuff. And so as long as they're uh, not having to deal with people, they feel pretty sanctified, right? But you don't, you don't know what work needs to be done until you're thrust into social interaction and then you reveal the things that are in you that God wants to deal with. So... Uh, I go to back to the church, and uh, I'm like, well, I'm, I'm here because God said, you know, kind of thing. And then they invited uh, men to be involved in children's ministry. And they said, you know, we, we have women that are always involving for children's ministry, but men never step up. It's like, come on, we need some guys to represent in children's ministry. So I'm thinking, well, that ain't me, you know. And then I'm looking at the table. They said, you know, see, here after the service... She'll be over there, men, for you to sign up. So I figured, oh, well, there are going to be a bunch of guys over there. Huge church, right? She's just sitting over there by herself, and nobody's going over there. And I'm like, oh, God, I know what you're doing here. <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, you know, move to the need, right? Uh, you know, man up and obey God. So I go over there. They sign me up. I had a wonderful experience in children's ministry, three years uh, ministering to, from three, three to five-year-olds, which really prepared me for my three-year-old. But... Uh, the point being is they said, well, the criteria for being involved in children's naturally you have to do the background check, all that stuff. And I love that and I get that. And they said, but you got to be a partner in the ministry. So you got to go to the partnership class. So I go to the partnership class and Pastor Jack is there. And there's like 50 people that are partnering with the ministry and he's, he's sharing the vision of the church and he's talking about what God wants to do and, and it was good. And then they, and we had a, like a covenant meal. And then uh, we broke bread together. He got around, loved on people. And, uh, and then he said, come on, we're, we're in this together. We're all going to be made to drink into one spirit. We're going to take communion together. So I thought, cool. So we took communion, and uh, it, it was wonderful to see Jack up close because in a large church, you know, he just looks very small from the back. Um, but here he was being real interpersonal with new people and stuff, and I love that about him. The following Sunday, I go to the service, and he starts preaching, and I am blown away about the revelation that's hitting me. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, this guy's brilliant. How do you get so smart in just one week, right? <laughs> and then I realized, well, what God was downloading uh, to me in that moment was he said, you know, when you visit a church, you're not going to be impacted at the level that the people who are part of that family are going to be impacted because a lot of times God is flowing through the senior pastor to give revelation and encouragement to the people who are part of that family. And if you've not yet made a decision to be part of that family, you're not going to get the full impact of the anointing that's on the senior pastor. And when I saw that, and I realized that it wasn't until I covenanted and said, okay, I'm in, that all of a sudden I, be, I got new eyes. I got new ears. I began to see and hear things that I wasn't hearing before. That was a great revelation for me. And ever since that experience, I've been involved in three churches in 30 years. Uh, and I've always uh, been all in at some level. Uh, what I mean is, you know, you can't do everything by yourself, but I, I found my place, and I was faithful. 
Uh, there's a lot of people that have come to the church over the, my experience in watching people come and go in church. And uh, we realize that most of the time when people come to a church and they get involved, because they have to interact with people, um, there's always going to be in relationships the good, the bad, and the ugly. I don't care. It's, it's true on the job. It, it's true in the schools. Uh, wherever you go, you are confronted with uh, the demand to operate from the fruits of the Spirit. And those are challenged all the time. And uh, if you have rejection history, like I had rejection history, uh, you, those, those compensations, those counterfeit secret places are usually off in isolation somewhere. And like Pastor Virginia was sharing on Wednesday, you make excuses. Well, I connect with God in nature. You know, well, that's fine, but the whole world is dying around you, and while you're out fly fishing, people are going to hell, right? So maybe it's not just about you. Maybe it's about you allowing me to take you through process. Uh, the church is a wonderful place. It's a family. It's a hospital, right? Uh, it's, it's a party. It's a lot of fun, but it's also a refinery, right, where God uh, works on uh, your identity. Uh, we start off with very serious identity issues. And out of identity issues, we don't think correctly. Uh, I'm sure I'm the only one that's had this experience, but let's say you have an identity struggle. Let's say you have a rejection history. And, uh, and so you come into a church scenario and uh, somebody makes a comment and the enemy goes, oh, this is what they mean by that comment. How dare they, right? And then all of a sudden you get a little bit inflamed on the inside, but you're brassing it out on the outside. And, you know. and then you go home and for four days you can't sleep over a comment that somebody made. And uh, so finally you're just, well, I'm just going to give them a piece of my mind. I'm going to confront them. I'm going to get to the bottom of it. And you're all tweaked, right? And then you go up to them and you say, you know, I'm... Could you go over that thing that you said about me again? Because I may have misunderstood. You said this, and this is the way I took it. And they grab you by the hand and go, I am so sorry. That's not at all what I meant. I'm so sorry that you took it. No, we love you. As a matter of fact, we were thinking about calling you and asking you if you would like to be a part of this ministry. And you go, you lying devil. You tweaked me out for four days over something that was fantasy because I saw it through my rejection filters, right? Now, how are you going to be able to dismantle those filters if you don't get in the game of social interaction and partnering and getting on a team and getting involved? And yes, there's going to be some rubbing, right? But rubbing reveals what God wants to talk to you about. Most of the time we have a a bad social situation. We want to go to God and say, Lord, you need to talk to that person over there. Did you hear what they said to me? I mean, you just need to straighten them out and this, that, and the other. You know and I know that God talks to you about that person. He'll go, you know, well, that may have been wrong, but why is it touching you like this? Why are you reacting this? You know, I'm never going to stand with with you against somebody that I died for. You're going to have to get on board with me concerning what I'm trying to do in their life, not just your life. And you're like, you know, you want revenge. You know, you want something. You know, you want them to be publicly corrected so you can gloat because you hurt me. Well, they may have not even meant to hurt you. Or maybe God said, you know, I'm going to put some people in your life that are going to challenge your perceptions. I want to destroy your filters. And, and that's not always going to be a comfortable scenario, right? Put up the tree picture. I want to talk a little bit about that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm praying in O'Melveny, O'Melveny Park. It's a cool park for prayer. And uh, I'm walking and dialoguing with God a little bit. And I come around a corner. I see this tree. Now, I'm a hort major, so I, I'm fascinated by plant materials and the anomalies and all the stuff that go along with it. And God is always like, my kingdom's like this, my kingdom's like that, and showing me things in nature. And uh, so I come upon this sycamore tree, and I'm like, wow, what happened here? 
and I'm looking at it, and I realized that when this tree was very, very young, it had something called scaffold branching or lateral branching. And basically, when you prune a tree for health and structure and beauty, uh, any branches that are coming against each other, you remove so that everything grows out from the center. And, uh, but if nobody pays attention to the tree, a lot of times you get scaffold branching. And if they never pay attention to the tree, it matures that way. And what had happened was the branches grew across each other, right? And, you know, we come into the local church, and it's like, I love you, brother. I love you too, man. You know, and you're just like, we're together. We're in this together, right? And then the winds of adversity begin to blow, and then there's a rubbing. It's like, dude, what are you doing? Back up, dude. Get, get, out, of my, get out of my zone, man. You're in my bubble. Leave me alone. Hey, don't you talk to me that way. And all of a sudden, there's like, you realize, oh, my God, when the wind's blowing, you know, I don't feel the same way about this, brother, than I did when we first came together, Right? And marriages can be a challenging, too. There can be some winds, right? And so you're rubbing, you're rubbing. And, and if it rubs long enough, it begins, to, it begins to bleed, right? You can see uh, that the rubbing that took place here was over a protracted period of time. But as I was looking at it, and God was talking to me, and he said, but I also want you to recognize this. They didn't separate through the rubbing process. And at some point in time, that open wound became a graft. And when they grafted together and became one, they became a lifetime mutual support to one another. Sometimes the strength of a relationship is we have history. We've been through things. You know, when I got married, uh, I fell in love with all of Sandra's admirable qualities, right? And I focused on all the good things, right? But she's a human being. I'm a human being. We got together, and all of a sudden, we had ugly moments, right? And, uh, but we like, you know, well, this ugly moment's never going to drive us apart, right? This is just people poop. Where there's people, there's poop, and that's all there is to it. You can't get away from that, right? And so we hung in there. But we have hung in there so many times through difficult scenarios. We have fought battles together. We have recognized when we were fighting against each other that we were wrestling against flesh and blood, and we get a revelation together, and all of a sudden now we're Charlie's Angels back-to-back -back fighting the devil, <laughs> right? And, I, and so we have had so many victories together that now I can't imagine being with anyone else just because we have that history. So history creates a new bond that becomes inseparable. You know, I'm with you till the wheels fall off, no matter what comes against us. Yeah, we got ugly stuff, but we're human beings. God's still working on us. One of the best things that my wife ever said to me is when I got ugly one day, uh, and she just smiled and loved me anyway, right? And I got really convicted, and at the end of the day, I said, you know, I'm really sorry. And I, I had a flesh moment there. Do you forgive me? And she said, of course. I said, how come you're taking this so cool? And she says, she says, look, I know you, and I know what's not you. That wasn't you. That was so refreshing for me that she could differentiate between the heart man and the flesh man, and that she fell in love with the heart man, right? But that takes time, and that happens in church setting, right? You need to move towards connecting with people on a heart level. So you can have a relationship with God and maybe not go to church for a little while. But if you really have a relationship with God, you have to admit to yourself that God is always trying to move you to community, right? That's his mission statement, to gather all things together in one, in Christ, both in heaven and in earth. Unity was his idea. Uh, put up Ephesians 2.10, because we're created to do something. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk or live in them. So have you ever heard the statement, well, you know, pastor, I'm moving on because I'm just not being fed. Anybody ever hear that? Exit interviews, that's what you always hear because nobody wants to say, yeah, I'm leaving because I'm not really willing to deal with my baggage. Nobody says that, right? So it's like, I'm not being fed, right? Well, I get that at one level, but the thing of it is, is that I've learned that the feeding is not in the hearing. The feeding is in the doing of what you hear. Jesus said, my sustenance, my meat, my food, is not to hear the will of the Father, but to do the will of the Father, right? 
So a lot of people that say, well, I'm leaving because I'm not fed, they're not really involved, right? But when you get involved, you get new ears. All of a sudden, now you're hearing things from heaven because God said, I'm going to download revelation into you because you're in my game with me. And you're in it with your brothers and sisters. And I'm going to give you woody inventions and creative ideas to be amazing in this thing. But the revelation comes to you because you're partnering to do something amazing for God. But if you're not partnering, right, you're going to get revelation. But most of the revelation is going to be moving to you towards community. Because without process, there's no progress, right? Uh, so... People are part of our process, right? You can't get away from people being part of your process. Isolators, isolators rage against the truth. So now you, let's you say you're like me. You got rejection baggage and stuff, and all, but you have giftings, right? So you feel great when you move forward with your gifting and everybody celebrates you. But then they start to see the stuff that God's dealing with. And it's like, whoa, okay, he's got a gift, but I don't think he's ready for the platform. I don't think he's ready for this, that, and the other. And then, oh, that wounds because you haven't dealt with stuff, right? I'm a creative, and I, and I, and I think I'm pretty I, – I recognize that I'm a creative. I come up with great ideas. In 30 years, I've come up with a lot of cool stuff that we have implemented at the church. But creatives, they get a vision, Right? And then when they share their vision, they want everybody to go, dude, that's awesome. Let's just do it. But a lot of people say, well, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. And then the refiner comes in. Yeah, but what's it going to cost? What the heck with the cost? It's going to be awesome because we don't think because we're creative. Yeah, but it's not really practical. Or, you know, or how can we build a team for that? And one time we were doing something for the ministry that was similar to my heart, my house. And I, and I was involved in the creative process. And so we had this huge plastic um, playhouse for the kids and children's ministry. It was quite large, very cool with the door and the kitchen inside and everything. I said, let's take this thing, put it into the lobby and suspend it from chains from the ceiling. When people come in, it's like, ah, my heart, my house, it'll be awesome. People look, you know. And even when they leave, they'll think the house, the house, the house. Well, I'm not sure we can quite connect it up there because, you know, with these are this is suspended ceiling and the cost and the volunteer. And I'm like, oh, God, you know, I, I've already birthed it in the spirit. I can't back up now. I need the voila moment. Please work with me here. Creatives have a difficult time with the refiners, but God put refiners in the church, right? Refiners look after things that the practical elements of ministry that need to be looked after the crea creatives don't want to hear about. You need to partner and learn to collaborate with people who are there for a reason, even though it might rub against your image and vision of what should happen there. Does that make sense? Creatives don't like to collaborate because they derive their joy by what they create. Something other than what they see to them is a fly in the ointment. You must see that people, this is profound. The way I have to process uh, collaborating, saying, well, here's a good idea. Yeah, not, maybe not, not now, but we could do this. And for me to go, all right, man, let's do that. Okay, for me to get from the way I used to be to the way I am now as a, as a team player, I have to recognize this is not about the project. This is about people, right? God did not create people to do his projects. God created projects to develop his people, right? And so if I think this is going to be amazing and it's going to impact people, and a person over here on the team says, well, I really think we should do this, I'm thinking, okay, the project now for me is him. Right? That's awesome, dude. That's a great idea. I'm behind you. We're going to work on that together. Because it's all about people development. You know, God doesn't need us to do projects. Right? He could just go, let there be everything. And he can have whatever it is that he wants. But he involves us in the process. Because process requires that we work together. Right? And we are developed together. You know, we're better together. But in ministry, we don't always feel better together, but we get better together. Does that make sense? That means we have to work through stuff together. 
and we're going to love each other more. You ever hear those stories, those Rambo stories where the Vietnam vets, you know, they're in the foxhole, they hate each other, yelling at each other, they hate everything that they're going through. But then when they come home, all they want to do is get back with their brothers because the rest of the world doesn't understand them. Why? Because they've been through hell together, right? And when you fought and argued and been through hell with somebody and everything, you get that tree bond, right? And then all of a sudden, they're the only people that get you, right? So that, that's important. When you get somebody on your team, you have to exercise them a little bit. You don't know somebody. You don't know what's in somebody until you tell them no, right? And you don't know really what's in you until someone tells you no. And then all of a sudden, something rises up, and God said, oh, I got stuff to deal with there. And so God has to get involved. There is a refining process that God's involved. I brought some props over here that are kind of cool. Now, church is awesome. I don't want anybody that's maybe either come for a first time that it's all about struggle. It's not. Sometimes it's pure joy, right? To go out after church and out there and sit and have coffee and talk with people. Uh, you know, when Sandra and I first came to the church, uh, we had been part of the family for, for me for 20 years. So I believe God had called us here, but it was a challenge for us to transition. And I would just like to personally thank you guys on behalf of myself and my family that you have received us and made us feel like family in a very real and accelerated way uh, because it's awkward to graft yourself into a new family. And I just want to just say you guys have been awesome. Thank you for embracing us. <laughs> so as I'm thinking about this message, I, I, I almost had this imagery of the Lord uh, speaking to an angel and dialoguing with him. It almost came to me like in a play scenario. And it was like Jesus like walked over to the angel and he's like, check this out. This is so cool. And the angel like, yeah. And he goes, look, this just came in. And he'll go, yeah. And he said, isn't it wonderful? Yes. It's a rock, Jesus. And it's a dirty rock. Yes, it is. And it's wonderful. What makes it so wonderful? It's got gold inside. And the angel's like, how do you know? He said, because I put it there. Right? <laughs> That's what I do. Right? And he said, this is going to be so amazing. And the angels are trying to figure out why Jesus is so excited. And he says, it just needs a little process. You know, as pastors and leaders, we're supposed to be gold miners, treasure hunters. We're supposed to find the redemptive uh, potential in the dirtiest of people that come to church and go, isn't it wonderful? Look at him. Okay, he's homeless. He just stumbled in. He puked on the carpet. I know, it's so cool. <laughs> we have to get there because revival is going to force us to adopt that mindset. Look for the gold, not to the dirt. Oh, dear Jesus. Okay. <laughs> so, Jesus said, I just need to do a little work, right? So, he's not going to like this, but I'm going to put him in a local church, and we're going to have to do a little chipping. He's like, no, Jesus. Yeah, it's going to be so cool. A little chipping. And then, what we got to do is we got to get the chippy. And we gotta, we're gonna have to put a little fire in there. And it's like, and then, and it's like, ah, no! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Elevate Church. <laughs> it's, it's so cool. Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, what I show you. You're, you're gonna learn things in there. It's gonna be amazing. Yeah, you'll like it. Oh, oh. Oh, he's going to bail on me. Okay, we'll turn the heat down a little bit. Okay. I'm going to love you, Lord. And I lift my foot. What? What? Oh, yeah. That was the wrong thing to say. That was the wrong attitude. Psst. Ah! Okay, a little more fire, right? Oh, you know what? It's going to take a little bit more than heat. I think we're going to have to get a little grinding here, here to get some of that. Uh, poor self-image off you right there. And grind that. And then a little bit more heat. Okay. 
There we go. And the angel's watching the whole process going, wow, all that. Is it worth it? Oh, it's worth it, right? Because look, look, look. Look, isn't that beautiful? Yeah, that's what was inside that you didn't see, but I saw it. Redemptive potential. And then, and the angel said, is that the end game? Oh, no, unfortunately not. He's going to have to go back a little bit. <laughs> because the end game is a golden vessel that's meet for the master's use. Somebody who's been tried and tested in the fire and has been found incorruptible. No matter what the enemy throws at him, they keep a sweet spirit. They walk in love. They forgive. Those are the kind of people that I can trust to contain the level of glory that I have for them. They're crying out for glory, and I give them process. And they're like, no, you misunderstand. I want glory. I know. I know. <laughs> but you can't handle my glory yet. But when I'm done with you, this is you right here. And you'll be able to continue the glory. <laughs> Welcome to church. Okay. Now, is it always this? No, it's not always this. But it's part of that. No soldier ever enjoyed boot camp until he was in a battle. And then he thanked God that he was trained, right? We're in a battle whether you know it or not, right? You just watch the news. I can't even believe what's happening in our world right now. I need to be prepared. You need to be prepared. Let's be prepared as a family together, right? Let's knit our hearts together and be there for one another. Let's endure the rubbing and let the rubbing turn into a graft that's inseparable because we're better together. We're stronger together. We're an army together, right? Let's get one voice, one mind and recognize that if something happens relationally or in any way in this church, instead of looking at it as a negative that drives you away from Jesus, let it drive you to the feet of Jesus because this is all that's happening. And it's good for you. It's good for us. When God wants to refine people, he gives them pastors. But when he wants to refine pastors, he gives them people. So you need to be patient with pastors. They're not perfect. They're in process just like us. So if they make a mistake, just smile, pray, forgive. Say, pastors are in process. And I get to be a part of their process, right? This is where we are as a church. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.